a lot, but like, is there any situations like from a clinical standpoint that you've seen lately that you'd want to share that are interesting or like difficult cases that you've had to, that just kind of popped to your mind that you've had to deal with recently? Yeah. You know, I think. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to episode 550 of the Core Console RX podcast. My name is Mike Corvino. With me, as always, Cole Swanson. And today we have a super special guest for episode 50. We saved it just for him, Dr. Eric Meisner. Sir, how are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you. They, so uh, you have an MD, PhD, which is a uh, very difficult thing to accomplish. Um, and very uh, out of the ordinary, I guess. Usually people pick one or the other, and you just decided to go ahead and crush out both of them. So um, have you always kind of uh, looked at that, um, you know, going back? I mean, now you're an expert in HIV, Hep C. Um, has this always kind of been the career path for you? We're just going to jump right, right into it, so, you know. Yeah, I mean, basically what that means is I never wanted to grow up, and I like going to school. Um, <laughs> Um, But seriously, no, I've always been interested in, um, you know, people that are getting sick from viruses specifically. I've always been interested in trying to understand why some people get sick, why other people don't, uh, why some people get infected, why other people don't. Um, Trying to learn about that um, through research and then um, trying to apply that to real people and try to help people out. It's always been my passion as far as professionals concerned. What age were you when you kind of decided that the clinical medicine route was where you're going? Uh, I'm not sure. I was always just sort of following along, but I mean, I think um, in college I knew I wanted to do something, um, something in medicine and research. My parents are both lifelong researchers. And so um, sort of around that and uh, yeah, just, uh, I was just going along for the ride and ended up pursuing both paths and um, here I am. So that's kind of where the, the pursuit of the PhD came from, I guess, was the interest in research. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and so, yeah, I mean, what I do now um, is an is a, uh, uh, extension of, of that training and, um, you know, trying to take care of patients, um, but then also trying to um, learn from uh, those experiences. And um, I have a laboratory uh, where we do experiments. And um, again, we try to understand um, the immune response, why some people get sick. And uh, the whole point of that is to think about how we might design new medicines and um, understand um, human health better. Wow. Um, So which came first? Did you do the both degrees at the same time or were you in research and then went back to medical school or? Yeah, it's a little weird. And so, uh, you know, when I came out of college, you sort of sign up for the whole program at once and it's, uh, it's split up. And so you do two years of medical school where you sit around in class and try to learn as much as possible, and then you disappear for a while into the lab. That's a four-year process. Mm -hmm. Um, That's where you do experiments, try to write up some papers, try to give some talks, and try to figure something out and learn how to be a scientist. And then after that, you go back and do the final two years of medical school where you're on the wards and seeing patients. Um, And so it's split up a little bit. Hmm. Um, uh, And those are, so those are designed uh, programs all around the country um, for folks that know they're interested in um, some combination uh, training. So you had four years in between your classroom stuff and your traditional clinical? That's right. Wow. That's right. So how was that going back into the clinical world? If you've been you know, working as a scientist for all those years, was it difficult to transition back to a clinician or was it pretty? It was, uh, it was wonderful, hard, easy, you know, all those things. It's very different. Um, uh, you know, in research, uh, most things don't work. Um, you have a lot of ideas, you try them out. Um, but in general, um, success is the exception. Um, and trial and error is a big part of it. Um, uh, yeah, you spend four years and you learn a lot about a lot of things, um, very specific for the lab. Um, and then you go back to, you know, seeing real people with real problems and, um, um, you know, trying to help people out and success is more frequent, um, I think there, um, and it's just a different thing talking to people, trying to figure out what's going on versus asking a question in the laboratory. Um, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the, the, um, variety of trying to hang out in sort of both arenas. Um, I enjoy that to this day, um, trying to sort of marry those worlds together. How is the interactions with, you know, with other researchers versus other clinicians? Do you, um, is there a difference in personalities kind of thing that you have to sort of um, gear, I guess, when you're with one group versus the other? Or is it pretty easy just to kind of 
play in both worlds. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's easy, but it's fun. Um, you know, d- people are different. Uh, all docs are different from each other. Our, our pharmacists are different. All researchers are different. Um, but I do enjoy, um, you know, I'm not the best researcher in the world, far from it. Um, but I do enjoy understanding um, research and hanging out with researchers and being able to offer a clinical perspective. Um, same is true for the physician world. I'm not the best physician in the world, but I enjoy having some, you know, being a physician, uh, being able to offer the research perspective there. Um, and so being able to see both sides of the, the fence, if you will, um, is a perspective that I enjoy, which is why I sort of pursued that route. Which do you prefer? I prefer, um, uh, this is not the right word, but the schizophrenia of, of trying to hang out in all those worlds. <laughs> yeah. And so you trade off, um, you know, I think if you do one or two things all the time, you become an expert at it. So if you're doing multiple things, you sort of trade off with that a little bit. But um, the most enjoyable part on a daily basis is certainly helping patients out. Um, but long term, I enjoy the, the struggle um, of the research, um, which is a, sort of a month to year sort of thing, whereas patients, patient care is, um, you know, you're seeing patients every day and trying to help them out. So, yeah, I like the um, I like the variety. Yeah. What uh, what type of research do you, I mean, I'm sure you're working on a bunch of different projects, but is there anything that kind of stands out in your head as far as summarizing your your research side of things? Yeah, I mean, life is random. And so I was, um, and so after I did the MD-PhD program, I did three years of uh, internal medicine residency, um, so further training. And then I did four years of uh, infectious disease fellowship. I was up at the NIH um, and I, I joined a lab there as a, so I was doing clinical work, um, learning how to treat infections. Um, and I joined a lab that was doing clinical trials in hepatitis C. I joined the lab because I liked the guy and we got along um, and I was interested in HIV, which he'd done. And so I randomly got involved in um, the world of hepatitis C, which I knew nothing about until then. Um, and that was when the, uh, some of the medications that are now available um, were first being developed and studied mm-hmm. in clinical trials. And so it was a perfect opportunity for me because we were able to um, conduct some of those clinical trials and at the same time um, ask questions about uh, why some people were responding and others weren't. Um, and so the question I was working on then and I'm still working on to some de- degree today is uh, why do some patients Um, how are some patients cured with these new medicines for hepatitis C, um, whereas other patients relapse after treatment? Um, Is there a reason for that, or is it just random? Um, And so that's that's the uh, area I've been working on the last couple of years. So you've really been able to be a part of the landscape completely changing for both of those disease states with treatment, HIV and hep C. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, and hepatitis C, I mean, the amazing thing, it's been warp speed. Uh, When I started um, uh, there as a clinical fellow, um, and I mean, I was in that lab uh, five years ago, uh, relapse was common, um, and um, these treatments are really just being developed. Um, the explosion of medications that are on the market and the improvement in how well they work and the fact that hepatitis C um, is uh, uh, very susceptible to treatment um, is such that relapse is not common now. Um, It still happens, but uh, that has just changed um, over the last five years. Um, And it's a tribute, I think, to scientists um, pharmaceutical companies, physicians, patients, clinical trials, um, uh, and, you know, all starting with basic science, but ending up with drug development. Yeah. And it's just gone faster for hepatitis C than it has um, for many other things. Um, yes, tremendous advances in HIV as well that continue to this day. Um, but the rate um, at which hepatitis C sort of moved um, uh, was something else. Right. So do you enjoy uh, kind of a lot of researchers are obviously involved in academia as well. Do you enjoy um, the academic side of things? Do you enjoy teaching? I think you're, you're a professor at MUSC as well, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, um, yeah, I like being around um, uh, young minds and smart people as I get older. Um, and so, yeah, being around medical students, um, graduate students, um, uh, pharma- pharmacy students, et cetera, um, and delivering care, and um, uh, but also helping to try to set a good example and um, um, try to talk about how to think about things is uh, definitely something I enjoy. Uh, what you get when you work in academia, too, is um, as opposed to, um, you know, out out in your own private practices, you do get um, in- infrastructure and a team and administrative help and pharmacy help, and, um, and that um, uh, makes it easier to do your job for sure. So, yes, I definitely enjoy being in that kind of environment. 
How um, how do you feel as far as the the challenge? Which which is more challenging for you, um, Hep C or HIV? Yeah, Hep C is um, there are different challenges, um, and so the the type of challenge is different. Hepatitis C. Um, the medical part, uh, the treatment part, um, once you know what you're doing is uh, quite easy. Um, if you don't know what you're doing, it, it can seem hard, yeah. um, but it's like riding a bike. Once you know how to do it, um, you remember how to ride a bike and you don't fall off. Uh, the real challenge with hep C is um, hepatitis C is uh, finding everyone um, that needs treatment and getting those um, persons um, into a setting or a situation where they can get access to the treatment. Um, that is the, the main challenge today, the economics, the public health, um, the medications and the treatment themselves. Um, yes, there are steps to follow and yes, you need to do it right. Um, but it is not a situation where we're limited in terms of our medical options. Uh, the tools we have medically are fantastic and they work for nearly all patients. And so getting those um, fantastic um, options to the patients that need them, many of whom are undiagnosed. Um, that is the real challenge um, in front of us. Um, HIV is slightly different. We know um, uh, we have a greater sense of, uh, I guess there's less undiagnosed persons with HIV. Um, there are ongoing active um, transmission. South Carolina is, is quite high in that. Um, we do have fantastic tools there as well. Um, but it's a different sort of um, it's a different sort of entity. Hepatitis C, you treat, cure, um, and that's it. Um, if they have significant liver disease, you still have to assess that. Um, HIV is lifelong therapy, um, and at the moment is taking a medicine every day. And so the, the kind of treatment and the nature of treatment um, is a little bit different um, uh, for those two different infections. So for hep C, is there a concerted effort towards getting non-specialist primary care docs trained and comfortable with just treating that so they don't even have to <clears throat> refer them out unless there's significant uh, cirrhosis or other issues going on? Yeah, I like the way you put it, concerted effort. Yeah, I'm not sure if there's a concerted effort. Um, you know, I'm not sure. I, I, I think the, the world of hepatitis C um, doesn't quite have any um, as many resources um, for the coordination of concerted efforts. Um, uh, and so, yes, um, um, but the second part of what you said is absolutely true. And so hepatitis C is very amenable um, to treatment by a variety of different medical um, specialists. Um, and there are so many patients with it that um, it is important um, to have people across the medical spectrum trained in delivering that. Um, uh, if we relied on just um, subspecialists um, to do it, there's an issue of patient to physician ratio um, that, right. is, um, that is challenging. Um, and so, yeah, there are a number of efforts um, ongoing um, in the state. Um, for example, there's a telehealth run out of um, USC that we participate in. Um, to help um, non-subspecialists um, deliver good hepatitis C care. Um, I do agree with uh, what you said, though, is, um, um, you know, in our state and others, um, it would benefit um, certainly from continued concerted efforts um, um, uh, to deliver the message and to, um, you know, have a, in theory, a integrated, coordinated um, uh, health infrastructure such that Wherever you live, rural, urban, uh, whatever insurance you have, um, you would have access to someone that could treat hepatitis C. Right. Um, but there's certainly a lot of work to do on that front. Yeah. The uh, the telehealth program is that uh, specifically for you know for clinicians who are dealing with actual patients, or is it for continuing education, all the above? Yeah, excellent. And so, I mean, hepatitis C telehealth, um, particularly out west, um, you took uh, was one of the first examples of that working really well. Um, I won't go into that history, but what we do is, um, uh, and so it's a collaboration run out of USC. I participate, and uh, Vanderbilt participates, and it's a provider to provider telehealth. And so, um, non subspecialist primary care physicians who are in, um, you know, sometimes federally, federally qualified health centers, um, free clinics, um, who have an interest um, in taking up hepatitis C. They'll submit cases, um, and then we all get on three times a month, um, and we discuss um, the cases and the details, and we um, share ideas and advice about how that particular patient would benefit from treatment. Um, I enjoy it. You know, I help present, but I always learn from um, uh, my colleagues as well, um, because as, as um, 
you know, as algorithmic and sort of straightforward as hepatitis C treatment is, um, every patient is different, and there's always some uncertainty, um, um, you know, for the different steps. And so there's value in, um, in having a discussion um, on, on that front. Um, is it something that only a clinician can kind of get access to, or if there was a student that was interested in infectious disease, would they be able to watch and not, maybe not necessarily participate, but at least inter, you know listen to you guys interact? Yeah, absolutely. I believe it's a fully democratic um, operation. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'd be happy to to provide that information for anyone that's interested. And um, yeah, um, and around uh, you know wherever you are around the country, um, uh, it's quite common actually now to have um, hepatitis C telehealth in addition to the many other things managed by telehealth. But hepatitis C was one of the first ones um, amenable that, you know, particularly for rural areas where there's not going to be um, a lot of subspecialists, but there are primary care providers, um, again, as part of the mission for hep C, finding patients, that means testing patients and seeing them in medical settings. And then once you diagnose hepatitis C, which is incredibly common, you know, one mm percent -hmm. of people in our country, mm -hmm. um, roughly. Once you find it, um, then you got to know the the tricks to to help um, cure patients of it. So, you know, we have a lot of listeners that are um, PharmDs, PAs, nurse practitioners. Um, what are some of the ways that, like, you know, the mid levels can get involved in, the PharmDs can get involved in? Like, what's kind of their role in Hep C? Yeah, their role can be front and center, um, and so hepatitis C is fully, completely amenable um, to being managed um, by PharmDs, PAs, nurse practitioners, et cetera. Um, yeah, I think the key is, um, you know, for hepatitis C, um, there is an algorithm for how to cure it. The most important thing is figuring out um, where your patient's liver is at, and so if your patient does not have significant liver disease, say they're 25 years old and they got infected two years ago, mm -hmm. you can cure them and their liver is likely to be just fine for life. On the other hand, um, if you have a 65-year-old patient who's had infection for 40 years and has cirrhosis, um, then the, the ante goes up a little bit, if you will. Um, not only should you cure your hepatitis C, um, but then you also need to fully understand and address the liver disease um, and sometimes um, that's best um, done by a, a liver specialist. Um, um, in other cases, that can be managed um, depending on the details um, by a primary care provider. Um, but as a provider caring for a patient with hepatitis C, in addition to curing everyone, you got to figure out where their liver is at and uh, make sure you tend to that. Um, as an example, if you do have cirrhosis and you have hepatitis C, Yes, you should be cured uh, immediately, um, but you deal, still do have some risk of the complications of the liver disease as you age, and so that needs to be monitored um, over time. Gotcha. So, um, kind of, you know, this seems to be a, a big passion of yours. I mean, I, you're taking time to talk to us now. Um, yeah, just for those of you listening, um, you know, you came and talked to me and uh, uh, my boss at uh, one of, you know, the, the clinic that I work at. And uh, in the middle of the day, spent time coming and talking to us for a while. I've learned a ton just from sitting there and listening to you just for a couple hours. Um, you know, have you, have you always kind of had this passion towards, um, you know, and I asked you this a little bit earlier as far as the infectious disease component or was, um, you know, hep C, is this kind of just built up in, in HIV too, I'm sure, but is this kind of just the passion, is that sort of built up as you've gotten to know more of these patients and kind of gotten more involved in the, you know, in this profession? Yeah, I mean, I um, again, I enjoy just trying to help people out um, with whatever it is that I know. Um, you know, and for hepatitis C, coming and talking to you guys, I mean, now that we have the tools, um, you know, the medical tools are there, there's really no excuse not to figure out a way um, in whatever setting patients are at, if they're at a, um, if they're uninsured and they can't access, um, you know, care wherever they can access care somewhere and wherever that somewhere is, um, we best figure out how to get the um, um, the knowledge for how to treat um, hepatitis C um, there. And so, um, yeah, I mean, my passion for talking to people is um, is because there is no excuse not to sort of spread the word about um, about what we have at our disposal. You know, five, ten years ago, very different. Treatment was um, injectable interferon with very high side effects mm -hmm. um, and lower likelihood of cure. 
And so the, the impetus and the oomph to roll that out to everybody all at once, um, the, the ratio was different. Um, less likely to work, more likely to, to harm you with side effects. <laughs> that ratio cannot be more opposite um, today. And so that's why there's, uh, again, there's no excuse not to um, find a way to, to get this um, treatment to patients um, in the setting that they, find, that they are. With um, drug prices generally just remaining high, we have cheaper options for hep C and stuff now. Is it seeming like the prices are going to be going down, insurances are going to cover it uh, more readily, uh, or you know, does it look like we're going to have to wait 15, 20 years for patents to start running out before it'll be more ubiquitous? Yeah, you'll get me going on cost here, which um, I enjoy talking about. But um, yeah, I think there's a few messages there. Um, in the last few years, due to competition um, amongst different pharmaceutical companies, the price has indeed gone down. Um, so it is still expensive, um, but it is not expensive as expensive as it used to be. Um, in South Carolina um, today, um, if you show up in my clinic or any clinic, um, regardless of what your insurance status is um, or who your insurer is or if you're uninsured, um, there are tricks within our healthcare system um, to get you access to the medication. Um, and so there are some um, hurdles and hoops to jump through um, for any patient to get them access to care, um, uh, but those are not insurmountable. Um, for me, the number one predictor of hepatitis C cure is who actually comes to the appointment. Mm -hmm. and so if you come to the appointment, um, you get the blood work done, um, and you go through the steps to get access to the medicine, um, you know, the treatments these days have a 95 to 98% cure rate. Um, the number one predicting, predictor of not getting cured um, is not coming to your appointment, um, and that can be for a variety of reasons. Active substance use, um, transportation, didn't know you had an appointment in jail, have other things going on. Um, um, but if you are able to, to, to come um, to care, um, in spite of the cost of the medication, um, uh, we're usually uh, uh, good at, uh, at, that's usually not a barrier to right. cure. That's great. It really is a unique situation because you mentioned HIV pills every day, probably for the rest of your life. Diabetes pills every day, probably or injections even probably for the rest of your life. But 16, 12, even eight weeks, you can be completely done with treatment and it's just follow up from then on. That's pretty interesting. Why you and this is probably the most simple question I'll ever be asked, but you know, why was it so e I don't want to say easy, but why was it were we so quick to find a cure for hep C versus HIV? Ah, uh, wonderful question. And so uh, number one, I mean, there was a delay um, with respect to HIV for hepatitis C in terms of drug development, even though we knew about them for sort of the same amount of time. Um, and part of that um, had to do with hepatitis C. It was very hard to grow in culture in the laboratory. Um, and so HIV, you can um, uh, isolate from a patient and pretty easily in the laboratory grow it up and study it. Um, hepatitis C was not as amenable to that. Um, and so not having the, the ease of study in the lab for basic scientists um, was one barrier for hepatitis C. Um, the absolute key for hepatitis C is that it is a flavivirus, um, which is, um, it's an RNA virus. And so it does, um, I guess, starting with HIV, HIV is a retrovirus. Um, and the reason it is so successful is that it um, uh, into, turns into DNA um, uh, within your cell and then becomes integrated in your own DNA. And so that is a challenge with HIV is we cannot get that integrated DNA out of our own cells. Um, we have not figured out a way to do that yet, um, with the exception of the one patient um, who's been cured of HIV. Um, hepatitis C is a very different virus. It's an RNA virus. It does not get integrated in our cell. Um, and so it requires constant replication every single second of every single day over decades. And so if you can roll in and block that process with a drug, you can wait hepatitis C out. And so when you treat patients for 8 to 12 weeks and you shut down that process that that particular virus requires, that continuous replication, um, you can eliminate it. 
HIV, you can treat patients forever, but because it's integrated in our DNA, um, that's why we can never wait it out. Um, and so the, the nature, and this is the interesting part about, you know, understanding the lab and the, and the patient, the nature of the virus, like the kind of virus it is, is why hepatitis C is so easy to cure and HIV and hepatitis B um, is another example are incurable um, because we haven't figured out a trick to get that integrated DNA out yet. Hmm. Fascinating. So I, I may have been living under a rock, but um, you said that we've actually cured a patient with HIV. Yeah, so there was, uh, uh, if you want to Google it up, um, he's uh, known as the uh, Berlin patient. His name is Timothy Brown, and um, it's, a, it's a case that um, sort of um, uh, revitalized or uh, further vitalized the HIV research community. Um, he was a patient that had um, a hematologic malignancy, um, and as part of the treatment for that malignancy, had to go um, undergo um, chemotherapy and stem cell transplantation. Um, his um, clinical uh, physicians um, undertook it upon themselves to try to design that therapy in a way that would make it harder um, for HIV to um, infect his transplanted immune system. Um, and as it turns out, um, they were successful. Um, and so he's been followed now for many years um, since he um, survived his chemotherapy and transplantation. And there's no um, signs of residual HIV in his body. Um, this is not a treatment that is, um, uh, could be considered for any normal patient with HIV because the risks of that are so astronomically high. Um, but it is a proof of principle um, that um, if there is a safe way, perhaps, to recapitulate um, that sort of approach, um, that um, the virus um, can be, um, in theory, eliminated. And so uh, many of the current ongoing um, uh, studies for HIV that are sort of at the cutting edge um, uh, revolve around how do we um, try to get rid of that reservoir that is stuck inside of um, infected patients. Are there any tricks that we could do to sort of get it out or coax it out or physically remove it um, short of giving someone this really dramatic treatment that he needed because he had this cancer? Yeah. Did you, did you hear about that? I had heard, I'd heard it had something to do with transplant, but I had heard mention of that. Yeah. That's cool. Um, I mean, if you were to just take a wild stab in the dark, I mean, how many years do you think we are? I mean, are we, do you feel like we're getting pretty close or are we still quite a bit away from actually finding a, a true cure? I would say that there's a lot of super smart um, and completely dedicated um, researchers and physicians all around the world that are actively working on this. Um, the progress that's been made in terms of understanding what's not going to work and what might work has been tremendous. Um, but um, I hope that, um, you know, in our lifetime that we will see something like that. Um, but I just don't know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, uh, again, research. Um, the, the usual answer is that didn't work. Um, and then the usual solution to that is, well, what are we going to try next? Um, and so there's still a lot of those moments um, to come. Um, a lot of, I'm sure, failures. Um, but with each failure, there's a lesson learned. And, um, you know, I think the collective um, efforts um, of the HIV research and clinical community um, I have confidence they're, you know, they're doing their best and that, um, um, I hope, uh, but I wouldn't hazard a uh, prediction there. Yeah. Gotcha. It just seems crazy that there's this, a virus that can be so deadly and so, you know, just resistant to all the science that we've, you know, put forward this, you know, at this point and we still can't even touch this little microscopic, it's crazy. That is crazy. But I think it's also the other important message though, is that, um, you know, the, the, uh, medication advances in HIV have been no less astronomical. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I think the important <laughs> message on HIV is that for patients that are engaged in care, um, and um, are able to access and be adherent to treatment, which these days is often uh, one pill a day. They can expect a normal lifespan, yeah. live to their 70s, live to their 80s, live to their 90s. Um, uh, and so, yes, uh, the virus is insurmountable in terms of our ability to extricate it, um, but in terms of our ability to suppress it and prevent it from causing AIDS, 
Um, we also have the tools at our disposal. Um, there are advances in that field as well, and so we're not too far off from injectable um, therapy for HIV for patients for whom that would be a better option. Um, this would look something like um, an injection every couple months um, hmm. without a daily medication, um, and so that's hopefully not too far off. And, um, um, and so the tools in our toolkit to help folks with HIV infection um, are, are also great today. Again, the, the issue there um, is um, preventing new infections and then uh, making sure patients that have infection um, are able to access care and access those treatments. Um, you know, kind of in regards to further research and whatnot, you said you have a lab currently. Um, how often do you spend time doing research now versus cl clinical work? Yeah, um, yeah. Don't ask me what my day looks like, um, <laughs> uh, but um, uh, yeah, every day is a little bit different. Um, you know, I have a regular clinical um, clinic schedule. I also work in the hospital um, at different times during the year, um, and then I have a lab with a technician and the students um, in there, um, and then I have a variety of other wonderful academic um, uh, responsibilities. And so, yeah, each day is a little bit of everything, um, and. Um, <clears throat> You know, the challenge is uh, finding the time to do everything um, as well as possible. Um, but that's also what I enjoy, um, sort of bouncing back and forth between um, seeing a patient and, you know, trying to design an experiment. Um, that's uh, what my training was supposed to be for. And, um, yeah, I still enjoy trying to balance that to this day. Yeah. Do you, is that for you? Because I know for me personally, and I'm, just, you know, for Cole as well, I know this, doing this kind of stuff, talking about evidence-based medicine and whatnot, for us is, you know, in a nerdy way, fun. So, like, a lot of people always will say to me, you know, oh, you're going to burn yourself out, you're going to do this, but where some people like to go to the beach or some people like to do whatever, I enjoy this. You know, it's not in my normal job, but I get to still discuss and talk about medication and pharmacotherapy. Do you feel kind of the same way to where you're, is that just fun for you? I mean, work is, is your fun and that's your hobby, if you will. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I'm not going to say that every day is a cup of rice, right, 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 but, um, but yeah, but no, I mean, I think for any job, if you're not enjoying it, you're going to burn out and it doesn't matter what it is. And I, I'm, I've been very fortunate along the way. I've been given every opportunity um, to do what I'm doing. Um, the, the road for me, um, um, you know, I've been helped by so many people. And so I, I basically can't complain um, uh, when times are tough because I've had such, um, such opportunity to do it, what I enjoy. And um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you never know sort of where the path is going in your life and what you're going to do next. Um, but, um, you know, I'm uh, like everyone else. I'm just guided by, um, uh, you know, what pops up in front of you on a, on a daily basis. And, um, and so, yeah, I enjoy, um, talking to patients and, and, um, explaining, uh, medications and trying to identify where they're coming from. And, um, and, uh, and, you know, in research is, um, you know, trying to find a good question to try to ask that you have the ability to answer. I enjoy um, uh, trying to come up with that, although, um, you know, that's actually the hardest part, you know, figuring out a good question that you can try to answer. Um, but, yeah, I enjoy that process. Well, I mean, obviously, if someone who spent so much time, you know, in school and, and working super hard through residency and all that, uh, what would you say to, as far as advice goes for students, um, one of the, the things that I kind of always advocate for personally when I'm talking to students is that you need to find every opportunity you can because you never, what the worst that could happen is you're going to waste a couple hours. You never know what, what kind of door that's going to open. Um, some of the pushback that I get is, well, you know, you, they like to say, you don't know how, how, you know, how much I have going on. I'm like, mm, I kind of do. It wasn't that long ago. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the other part is they'll just say, oh, we just have this, or I'll just wait till I finish school and then I'll go tackle all these different things um what's your advice for students in school yeah i think there's two sides to that i mean there's a book i read my kids little rhino says no um, <laughs> and, you know little rhino says no to everything and the little rhino doesn't get to do anything and finally little rhino says yes and all of a sudden um the world the world is his oyster and so yeah i do think when you're in school it is good to challenge yourself push yourself say yes to things that you might not um, uh, intrinsically want to say yes to, to, um, to broaden your horizons. And within that, I would say, you know, seeing, um, as many sort of 
people and perspectives and um, as possible so you can develop your own approach um, is good. Um, on the flip side of that, um, you know, and especially where I'm at now, if, if you if your little rhino says yes to everything and you get spread too thin, um, then you end up not having time to do anything well. And so I think where you are in the process and what your priorities are, um, sometimes you have to be the, the yes person, sometimes you have to be the no person. But as a student, um, the more you can do to sort of explore stuff, um, uh, the better. Because um, you'll be surprised, um, you know, you might find something um, uh, that you like um, uh, better than you expected. I think the other important thing, you know, as you go through the process, um, and it's actually quite hard, um, is finding good mentorship. And so finding someone that, um, uh, that understands you, understands what you're interested in, understand what you're trying to do, even though that may change over time, um, and has an interest in giving you advice, you know, should you say yes to this opportunity and no to that, um, uh, the more um, sort of mentorship you can capture for yourself um, along the way, the better. And often that um, is best done by, again, putting yourself out there, um, showing genuine enthusiasm and interest, even if you don't necessarily feel it every second of every day, and, um, and then, um, you know, asking, asking people what they think. What, you know, with you in your position currently, if you had a student, whether it was a medical student, pharmacy student, PhD student, whatever, um, what would stand out in your mind as far as somebody that would be impressive to you as a student? What would you look for? Yeah, I think the most important thing in life is um, uh, is you got to care. Um, and so um, you don't have to be the smartest. You don't have to be the, uh, you know, the the most amazing personality, um, uh, but you can't sort of fake effort. Um, I tell my kids this when they're, uh, uh, you know, when we're when we're doing stuff, you can't fake effort. And so, I, you know, for me, um, I value effort um, uh, above all. Um, and trying, um, it sounds simple, I mean, just trying your best, um, being persistent and, um, and caring, you know, I, to me, that's the most important thing. Obviously, if you're a patient and you um, are seeing a doctor, um, you're going to value that they know what they're talking about. Um, um, but in terms of, um, uh, you know, trying to find an answer, sticking with it, you know, this, this, the answer here is no, the answer there is no, you just keep keeping at it and being persistent. Um, to me, that's what um, always impresses me because it's hard to do because um, we're all spread thin and we're all tired. Um, and so st um, stick to itness, um, uh, I certainly value. So what's next uh, kind of for you personally, what's your next big challenge or hurdle that you're trying to climb and get over a goal, if you will? Yeah, my goal is, um, uh, is uh, first and foremost, um, be present and around for my family. Um, I got three kids and a wife that we live uh, live here. Um, they're going through elementary school, public school, and so that's uh, goal number one. Um, you know, goal number two is um, to continue to plug away um, in our HIV and hepatitis C clinic. Um, there is always room for improvements and new ideas. Um, and so we continue to work um, uh, on those fronts in the clinical realm. In the research realm, um, that's the hardest part. Um, and um, what I'm uh, trying to do is uh, take the lessons that I've learned from understanding hepatitis C and think about how, uh, how those might be applied to other areas like HIV or hepatitis B. Um, and so I certainly learned some things from hepatitis C through clinical care and through my research efforts about the immune system. Um, and the question is, um, um, you know, how can we, um, how can anyone that learns something about anything then apply that to the next thing um, that is in need uh, of a further study? And so hepatitis C, we need to get that drug in people's bellies um, that have the infection. That is um, the biggest need. Um, it's not like we really need a new drug uh, for hepatitis C. The ones we have now are phenomenal. Um, but for HIV and hepatitis B that are incurable, um, uh, there's still work to be done. Um, and so um, uh, my next um, big thing, which is what I've been thinking about for years, and, you know, it's hard to get there, but, um, you know, what question in that area am I with my um, background and skill set able to ask? Um, and so that's something I think about um, on a daily basis. Very cool. Uh, do you, so, you, like you said, we have such great drugs for Hep C. I mean, is that kind of where the research stops, or is there still a whole bunch of stuff in the pipeline for Hep C as well? 
Yeah, you know what we need for Hep C research um, that we still don't have is we don't have a vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, Hep B, we all get vaccinated uh, one second after we're born these days. Um, and so we have a phenomenal vaccine for Hepatitis B that uniformly prevents infection. Um, that is not in existence um, for Hepatitis C. And part of that is, again, goes back to the nature of the virus. It's highly error prone, highly variable. And so designing a vaccine for something that shifts around and moves so much um, uh, turns out to be um, hard. The other thing about vaccines is, um, you know, usually Mother Nature is, is way smarter than us. Um, and so, um, you know, if you get hepatitis C and you um, get cured or you clear it on your own, you can still get infected again. And so even though your body has been through the war of this virus, if you get exposed again, you sort of can be back to square one. Um, and so it's a shifty virus um, that takes advantage of um, the fact that it lives in the liver, which is prone to not sort of overreact. Um, and so that was a long-winded answer to your question, but um, what we really need for hepatitis C um, is a vaccine. Um, in terms of drug development, though, um, yes, there are some patients that still relapse with our greatest drugs, um, but the drugs that we have on the shelf right now um, will cure the vast majority of patients um, if we can get those drugs um, where they need to be. Right. So if the virus does, you know, change and shift and whatnot, so as far as like becoming reinfected, you said that for hep C, right? So is there a chance then that we're going to start seeing resistance pop up now that we've been curing these people? Is that going to be something that you think will be a big problem coming forward? Yeah, and it's interesting. And so um, uh, I don't think it's going to be a big problem. It is an issue that we deal with um, today. Um, and so um, I won't go into the specifics, but um, and so there are some first line hepatitis C drugs that will cure 95 to 98 percent of patients. Um, but for that two to five percent of patients, what happens is you treat them. It looks like it's going great. You can't detect the virus, but then it pops back up um, in the three months after you finish treatment. If you then go look at that virus, sometimes you'll find that it has uh, acquired um, a resistance uh, mutation. The good news is we have several approaches um, for retreatment of patients who have failed treatment. Um, and so resistance um, um, thus far um, is not an insurmountable barrier for the vast majority of patients. Again, HIV, when you get resistance, um, we sort of think that it's sort of in you for life because of this reservoir and because of this integrated um, DNA, but because hepatitis C reinvents itself every second of every day because of the kind of virus it is, um, an RNA virus that never goes to our nucleus um, um, uh, resistance. Um, big picture, while we still have a little bit to deal with there, um, is, is not the same sort of issue as it is for, um, for HIV. That makes sense. Um, so kind of, I guess, if, and this is kind of putting you in the spot, But like, is there any situations like from a clinical standpoint that you've seen lately that you'd want to share that are interesting or like difficult cases that you've had? Yeah, to, there's a lot with hepatitis C that and you've I had think, to deal with um, recently. I mean, I yeah, there's you know, a couple I think, messages in the way I could answer that. Um, you know, and so, I mean, we haven't mentioned this, but the most common way to get hepatitis C is through intravenous drug use. Um, and there are other ways to get it as well. Um, it is a virus that requires blood to blood transmission. Um, and so any sort of other blood exposure has the potential, um, but the vast majority of patients that are acquiring that infection um, is through an intravenous drug route. And so, um, yeah, I think the message is, um, you know, and there um, we have an opioid epidemic, um, which includes a lot of people that are um, uh, struggling with active intravenous drug use. Um, I think the message um, is, though, is that um, patients that are active intravenous drug users um, are just um, have just as good success in cure rates as those without. Um, and so um, it used to be five or 10 years ago when we were sort of stuck with these injectable treatments that if you had active substance use or active mental health um, struggles, um, that it was challenging to even entertain the idea of treating hepatitis C. 
Um, but there's really no patient for whom hepatitis C treatment um, can't be considered. Um, I think the only sort of exception is if you have someone that is um, an active alcoholic or an active intravenous drug user um, to the point that it's unlikely that they could um, be adherent with taking a medicine every day, um, then you may want to pause um, and think about getting them the, the resources they need to treat their um, addiction. Um, but if you have, and I hate to use this expression, but if you have a, a functional, um, you know, adherent with medications, intravenous drug user, there is no reason um, um, that you um, should not treat them. And I'll just, um, again, this is a long-winded answer. No, it's but, good. Yeah, but so I've had some patients um, that I've um, um, decided sort of to treat um, when they were still in the midst of struggling through some stuff. And hepatitis C, is um, it can be very forgiving. And so I had a patient that um, was not adherent with their medication, um, and did not take it for the entire duration prescribed, um, but that patient um, was lucky. And so hmm. um, not every patient needs 8 or 12 weeks. Um, they actually did trials of four weeks of therapy, yeah. and about 30% of patients were cured. Um, and so this particular patient didn't take it the right way and didn't take it long enough, yet she was cured hmm. um, because um, she had enough treatment for what her particular immune system and her body need, needed to get rid of that, um, uh, that virus. Yeah. And some people can just clear it completely on their own, correct? That's right. And so you have to be important if you're testing for hepatitis C um, to understand that. And so, yeah, about 15 to 20 percent of patients um, that get infected, their immune system, and again, this is why it's interesting to think about the immune system, um, their immune system uh, defeat the virus um, before it um, sets um, hold and develops a chronic infection. That battle is waged by all patients in the first six months of infection, unbeknownst to the patient, because there are usually no symptoms. Um, but about 15 to 20 percent of people um, will get rid of the virus on their own. And the way that gets discovered is they get a screening test for hepatitis C, um, which shows that they had infection before. And then if you then go look for the virus, which would be the confirmatory test, you find that there is no virus. Um, and so the vast majority of the time, um, there are some exceptions, but the vast majority of the time means that that's a person that had hepatitis C, uh, but that got rid of it on their own. Fascinatingly, they did a big study to try to figure out why that happened. Um, and they figured out that it had to do with host genetics um, mm -hmm. and the immune system um, and the variability between people, um, you know, that makes us all so different from each other. Um, this one particular gene and area ended up having a big importance for um, who gets rid of it on their own. Hmm. What, what do, do you, like, do you know offhand, like, what that gene actually, like, coded for? Was it a certain ethnicity or was it a certain type of Im immune cell? Yeah, and, and so that's one of the things that I'm interested in the, in my laboratory research is um, is trying to understand that a little bit better. And so, um, yeah, that phenotype of who clears the infection on their own maps to one of the interferon genes. And hmm. so, um, you know, we used to treat patients with um, interferon injections, but every single time you get a cold or the flu or whatever infection, um, one of the first parts of your immune system that gets turned on is this interferon system um, whose job is to alert you to the presence of a virus and um, prepare you to fight it off. That almost always works for all infections, um, but for chronic infections, um, that obviously hasn't worked. Um, but so the nature of the interferon response to hepatitis C, um, which goes back to host genetics, um, ends up having a huge influence on who gets rid of the virus on their own and um, who develops chronic infection. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, so what about, uh, you know, is there anything that comes to mind? Just because I know some people are going to want the, you know, who don't work in this are going to want some of the case studies, if you will. Um, is there anything that comes to mind as far as interesting um, cases that you've had with like drug interactions or something that had never been studied before that you had to kind of analytically work your way through? Yeah, uh, I, I'm trying to think of something sexy for you here. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, no, um, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, so in terms of, um, you know, what you do as an H hepatitis C provider is, yeah, there are some issues like drug interactions um, to sort through. Um, I mean, there's always, um, uh, there, there are, again, a few tricks along the way. Um, in terms of a, um, uh, a, a super cool story in case, um, I, I got to turn off my brain here for a second and run through my list, but um, <laughs> I'll, let me think about that. <laughs> okay. Um, so... I guess uh, I'm going to go through, I had uh, several people ask questions on Instagram, so I was, if it's okay, I'm going to read some of them through now and just kind of see what you think. Great. Um, let me pull some of these up real quick. Um, one of them, I remember offhand, um, was asked by, uh, he's a pharmacy student, I want to say P3, maybe P4, um, his name is Vince, um, and uh, he uh, he's really interested, I've talked to him before, and interacted with him, he wrote a blog for me just to kind of highlight some of the stuff he's doing, he's real passionate about um, substance abuse disorder and mental illness and things. Um, so he asked what it, your thoughts were about like community pharmacies, um, administering clean needles, um, to people who are coming up without, you know, making them identify insulin use or something like that. Um, do you think that that's, um, in your opinion, you know, obviously without getting political or argumentative, um, do you think that, uh, that's a, something that we should be advocating for? Or do you think that's a, from a public health standpoint, a good thing, or do you think that's a, uh, a, 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 a way of letting them continue their habit, if you will. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's interesting. South Carolina doesn't have any needle exchange, um, yet we certainly have a robust um, opioid epidemic, including intravenous drug <laughs> epidemic. Yeah, I definitively fall on the spectrum of um, providing clean supplies to patients um, is not something that is keeping the epidemic going or encouraging patients um, to use. And so, um, yes, I'm not an expert in the field, um, but providing um, patients access to um, um, through whatever venue to things that are going to reduce disease transmission um, you can count me in on that. Um, I mean, I, in terms of my own practice, if I'm taking care of a patient, um, you know, that we're treating for hepatitis C that is still working through, um, substances, that's part of the message is, um, um, Hey, we're going to do this and get you cured up and let's work on your substance use problem. But in the meantime, you know, we appreciate that that's a, um, an illness just like any other. Um, it's not going to go away overnight. In the meantime, let's make sure um, that you um, take steps um, to to avoid reinfection. Yeah. And so, um, yes, I would be a, um, a firm proponent of mm -hmm. access to anything that will prevent disease transmission. Yeah, I think there's. It's weird that it seems to be like kind of like the stigma as if like by us not providing these clean needles um, somehow hinders them from actually going, you know, engaging in this habit. And it's well, that's not how an addiction works i feel like there's enough data to kind of support that that's not kind of we're not helping anyone um really overcome addiction by just keeping them from having needles versus having you know behavioral therapy sessions and things like that but yes no, i would agree with that and i get and i think um you know meeting people where they are um and trying to provide people access to whatever it is that they may need in the setting that they are i think that's the um, that's the key. And so, yeah, if you have a, um, if you don't live in South Carolina and you have a needle exchange clinic, you know, maybe you, um, offer some hep C testing there. Um, and, um, uh, you know, trying to integrate, um, uh, care. And so if coming in for clean needles, um, um, is an opportunity to engage people and try to, um, help them, um, you know, I would view that as an opportunity yeah. um, to help people. For sure. I, I used to, I, I would always provide needles if somebody came in and asked for them without, you know, questioning them and whatnot. And I, I did used to enjoy the stories because they always hit you with the, the preemptive story before <laughs> they even ask. And uh, I had a few people, you know, oh, my grandma. They always pin it on grandma and she always has left her needles up in wherever she's from. It's usually and, her insulin. Yeah, needs her insulin. And I was like, all right, man, I got you. Let me go get grandma her needles. <laughs> so I, I used to enjoy that. <laughs> but, um, all right, so let's see. Somebody just asked uh, the question, if Clues are Maverick. 
Yeah, and so I think the um, and so those are two of the commercially available um, uh, medications. Um, you know, those happen to be the two on the Medicaid formulary in South Carolina as we speak. And I think the 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 take home message um, um, for hepatitis C, the way I look at it, is any old drug will do. And so there are certain situations where you may pick one hepatitis C drug over another. Um, but they all have um, um, very similar efficacy. Um, some of them will have different drug interactions depending on the other medications that they're on. Um, but the key is you want to be on a medication. Mm -hmm. And if your insurance company or provider pick one over the other, I would not lose a wink of sleep over it because um, they will all um, um, they will all do the job. Um, there are depending on which genotype you have and how sick your liver is and whether or not you've been treated before. There are reasons your provider will pick one medication over another. Right. Um, but as long as they sort of know those tricks and what they're doing. Um, um, all the medications um, work very well. And again, that goes back to the fact that the virus um, requires constant um, replication every day. So blocking that different ways with different drugs um, ends up working for most patients. Um, we had one person say that they have had three patients um, that needed their therapy changed because of a delay in treatment. Um, he said, you know, what's the, for you personally in your clinic, what's the biggest concern with patient follow-up um, as well as like the availability of these medications, you know, whether it's mail order or whatever? Yeah, and, and so there's a few things sort of embedded in that question. You know, I do think one thing that is important when you're going to embark on hep C treatment is you do want to commit um, to the best of your ability, to your availability for the next 8 to 12 weeks um, to take a medicine. Um, and you want to also know that whoever is paying for it, um, be it your insurer or whoever, is going to be around during that time. And so if your insurance is about to poof um, for whatever reason, um, right after you start treatment, um, you may want to rethink the timing. Um, or if you have stuff, whatever it is going on in your life that may be a barrier to taking this medicine, um, uh, then you may want to, again, reconsider um, the timing of the treatment. Um, the way the treatment works is you take this pill or pills every day um, for usually 8 to 12 weeks. And what you are doing when you take that is you are blocking the virus from doing its thing. Um, if you interrupt that and you give the virus an opportunity to not be blocked um, and sort of peter along or even come back up, um, uh, then the chances that you're not going to sort of wait the virus out by blocking it for long enough um, go up. Um, yeah, and so uh, I'm, uh, I'm not sure if I answered quite that question, um, but um, yeah, you want to make sure the patient, uh, the provider, and the payer, um, when you start, are sort of committed um, for the anticipated duration. And then once you start, um, you just want to make sure that, um, you know, life happens, stuff happens. But to the best of your ability, you want to make sure that you're ready to roll. Um, and again, it's not lifelong or a year or six months. It's two to three months. Um, and um, uh, you just want to be ready when you start. Yeah. What about in regards to, like, the pharmacy aspect, you know, getting the medication dispensed? Um, you have specialty pharmacy access at the medical university, but have, do you have to actually send the prescription out to certain mail order pharmacies that the third parties have contracted with? Do you have any issues when it comes to that area? Yeah, that's a whole that's a whole conversation. But um, uh, yeah, I think the first point there is um, sometimes patients come in and they expect you to pull it off the shelf, like um, you're giving them uh, Keflex for cellulitis or something. Um, and so yeah, these medicines do um, you know require prior authorization, and you when you as a physician go. Um, ask someone to pay um, tens of thousands of dollars for the treatment. Um, you do have to have your sort of ducks in a row in terms of the genotype and the viral load and the HIV status and the hepatitis B status. And, you know, you're not pregnant if you're a woman of childbearing age. And so you do have to have all those um, ducks in a row. And it's interesting. Yeah, we do have our own specialty pharmacy um, at our institution, but we also have uh, many patients that are insured um, that cannot have their medicines filled there. And so um, uh, the patients I care for, some of them um, who are uninsured get the medication from the um, support programs of the pharmaceutical programs themselves. Um, and that's in part because our state didn't expand Medicaid. Um, some um, have their medicines filled through um, an outside specialty pharmacy that is contracted with whoever there 
insurer is, um, and other patients have their medicines filled through our specialty pharmacy. The way that I interact with the patient um, actually does in part depend on who's filling the medicine um, because different specialty pharmacies sort of provide different things. Um, the one thing that sometimes gets dropped in terms of dropping the ball is, um, um, yeah, and so if you're being treated for two or three months, you're basically going to get um, either two or three shipments of the medicine. And what you don't want, and this occasionally happens if um, communication is not stellar, patient doesn't pick up the phone, pharmacy doesn't call back, EPS doesn't, you know, whatever. Um, occasionally there's an inadvertent delay between the months um, if there was not smooth operation with the med refill. Um, often these are shipped to patients' um, houses um, or picked up um, at, a, at a local pharmacy. And so you want to make sure that um, whoever's filling the med um, has got game in terms of um, communicating with the provider and the patient um, to avoid um, uh, completely unnecessary treatment lapses. Yeah. Let's see. Um, this is kind of switching gears a little bit to the HIV side of things, but um, there's two, a couple people have asked about uh, your thoughts on dual therapy um, for p patients who are uh, viral suppressed uh, with HIV. So things like um, the Julica and whatnot, what's your thoughts on using two agents instead of the three or four like we've been? Yeah, and so, um, yeah, so the standard of care for HIV, um, because of um, emerging resistance, because it's lifelong, has traditionally been um, three highly active antiviral medications. Um, we now have good data um, that for the right patient, um, and by the right patient, I mean someone that does not have a lot of um, archived resistance mutations, um, that two drug therapy, um, as our uh, drugs have approved, um, can be very effective um, for the right patient. And so, yes, we do have um, an FDA approved medication um, for use. And furthermore, there's uh, multiple ongoing clinical trials um, in progress for either treatment naive or treatment suppressed patients um, looking at um, dual therapy. Um, one of the main um, regimens being pursued for injectable therapy is also um, dual drug therapy. Um, and so, yeah, as um, the, the HIV um, uh, uh, medications have improved over time, um, the uh, efficacy and potency of them um, are such that some patients can be managed um, uh, with two drugs alone. There have even been trials of uh, monotherapy um, with one drug, and that's um, not recommended and has not panned out. Um, um, but um, I think the, um, uh, the, the take-home message is that there are many patients um, for whom um, a two-drug therapy may be appropriate as long as the rules for the use of um, uh, those medications are adhered to. Right. And one of the, I guess, arguments against it that I've heard, and you did kind of address this already, but um, like with dalutegravir being one of the drugs they typically use, or that's one I think they've studied in monotherapy as well, um, that's the integrated strand inhibitors is one of the areas where we actually see the least amount of resistance, especially with like a big tegravir now. Um, and they people were saying that, well, now we're about to introduce a whole bunch of potential resistance because we're using these um, without their to nuke backbone. Um, do you think there's some concern with that? Or is that just kind of what you were saying about the patient specific? Yeah, you know, I think we need to, um, you know, a lot of these drugs are, are new. Um, and so, you know, there's sort of a bit of a hiatus there um, a few years back where there wasn't a whole lot new coming out. But there's been a mini um, uh, explosion of single tablet regimens in HIV um, that incorporate some of the, in particular, new integrase inhibitors that are highly potent, um, do have a high barrier to resistance. And um, again, this goes back to research. I think those concerns, time will tell. Um, you're going to have patients on dual regimens that are suppressed and they're following the criteria that were tested in clinical trials. So let's see, three years out, mm -hmm. five years out, eight years out. Um, if that concern um, that you mentioned is true, then I think we should see it. Um, if patients remain um, fully suppressed as they have on trials and in clinical practice thus far, um, then I think, um, you know, that's the data. Um, uh, how we feel about it is important and what we think is important, but I think the most important thing is what does the data actually show? And, and um, you know, to get to be an FDA 
approved um, dual therapy <laughs> regimen. Um, that doesn't happen by accident. And so um, what that means is that the data supported um, uh, that approach through clinical trial. Um, again, those medicines haven't been around um, for decades. Um, and so we just have to see over time. Um, but um, by every criteria we use for um, uh, approving or considering new medicines, um, uh, you know, the ones that have approved have sort of met that standard. That's good. Um, another question that uh, came up that I thought was a pretty good one was, when is TAF not suitable for an HIV patient? Yeah, and so TAF, um, what that refers to is tenofovir alafenamide. Um, uh, the uh, original iteration of tenofovir was tenofovir disproxyl fumarate, or TDF. And so um, in recent years, um, they basically um, switched up um, the, the formulation of that medicine such that um, the actual milligrams you take for the same antivirologic benefit um, is much less because of the way the drug is metabolized. Um, and so the impact of that medicine on your bone and kidney health um, for TAF compared to TDF or tenofovir disproxyl fumarate is much less. Um, and so yeah, TAF thus far appears to work just as well as TDF. Um, but appears to have a better side effect profile. Um, <clears throat> there are still some patients um, who, um, you know, if they have significant renal disease, for example, um, <clears throat> Uh, that's probably the, the, the best example um, where you may not even want to use um, a TAF-based regimen. Um, and you may want to um, think about um, other HIV regimens that may be more um, uh, safe and convenient um, for renal dosing. Um, and so um, uh, does that answer that question? Yeah, no, that was good. Yeah, thanks, uh, did, um, this is totally off subject and random, but um, have, you, have you given talks on TAF maybe like 2016 or so at the uh, Columbia Symposium, the HIV Hep C Symposium. Did you talk there at all? Uh, I've talked there, but definitely not on TAF. I'm no mm. expert. No? Okay. Yeah. Um, did, did, I, I feel like I've seen you speak on at one of those symposiums before. Have you been there in the last few years? Yeah, I was there a few years ago, but uh, definitely didn't talk about TAF. <laughs> okay. It might not have been TAF. I'm trying to remember. I feel like I've seen, because um, I remember thinking, I was like, man, that guy's really tall. Mm. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and he, he's got a lot of letters after his name, too. <laughs> but um yeah that was a really i went there uh after right after i graduated i think just for kicks and giggles and um i was like uh like blown away by some of the research that had come out because i had very little uh interactions with that in school so it was a pretty cool conference that means uh that identifies you as someone that's still in their 20s am i right <laughs> no i'm so i'm 30 oh, I, hit the, I hit that 30 mark yes <laughs> all right my condolences yeah, yeah right. it was it was brutal <laughs> cole's still in his 20s cole's, cole's like 21 oh, I'm yeah basically <laughs> i'm in the wrong room in my heart yeah um so you know what kind of uh resources should students students or even clinicians or you know practicing pharmacists whatever who are interested in learning more what would some of the resources that you would recommend that they kind of seek out if they want to learn more about this and get more involved yeah i think um uh, first and foremost for the clinical part i think this is a good example of um of teamwork and working together and so um you know the old school way to do um treatment guidelines or recommendations was to get a bunch of people in a room and write up a big paper and publish it in a, in a journal. Um, but what they were able to do in the, the world that we live in is the um, the liver experts, um, the AASLD and the infectious disease experts, the IDSA, um, they gathered um, a panel of experts in hepatitis C and they generated an online breathing living resource um, for you and me um, um, to access at our leisure. And so um, that's hcvguidelines.org. And that is a phenomenal way to get yourself introduced to hep C um, because it'll talk through some of the things we talk to. Who do you treat? What do you monitor? What drugs do you use? Um, why would you choose this one over the other? Um, and it's updated on a regular basis. And so there are still trials ongoing um, and it changes. Um, you don't have to wait for the, the article to come out after being reviewed for six months. Um, you have to go to the website um, the day you're deciding what to treat your patient with. Um, and it may in fact have changed um, uh, because it is updated by experts on a regular basis. 
Um, the University of Washington has a phenomenal online hepatitis C course as well. And so going through both of those um, uh, in terms of preparing yourself to take it on is a phenomenal way um, to start, you know, wherever you are getting involved in um, um, telehealth um, or hanging out with someone that does it. Uh, um, um, Cause you know, there are as, as sort of straightforward as it is, there are some tricks um, and there are some pitfalls. Um, and so sort of talking through that with someone that may have done it, um, I think can be a benefit. Um, and then, um, you know, there's so many patients that will benefit from this. Um, and it works the majority of the time, as long as you, again, sort of know what you're doing, um, that, um, um, and then have at it. I mean, it's incredibly rewarding um, to treat because um, patients generally don't have side effects and it works and they're cured. And so, I mean, what could be better than that? Um, and so, yeah, you know, get into it, read about it, and then figure out, um, you know, who's doing it, where you are, and, you um, um, figure out how you might add it to what you're doing. I think a great example is, you know, substance um, use treaters um, that are engaged in patients that are at risk of um, or recovering from substance use is a phenomenal place for someone to, um, to pick up and think about hep C, and that means screening patients, um, identifying infection, providing education, and then um, thinking through how to access treatment. Um, uh, that, that would be my advice. Yeah, awesome. Excellent. So uh, any any last time I've kept you here way longer than I, you probably anticipated. So uh, I appreciate you sticking with us. But um, anything you want to add or any closing remarks you'd like to make for anybody listening that um, you know you think could be helpful to students or whoever that about you know Hep C or HIV in general. Anything you think of that we haven't talked about? Yeah, go go out there and make a difference. Um, and um, there's a lot to be done. Um, and um, uh, find people that are doing things that you're not good at that also care um, and uh, team up with them. That's usually when the magic happens is when you get people with different skill sets um, together um, uh, with a common interest. Um, uh, it's usually synergistic if you are lucky enough to um, to bump into someone that um, that has that. You doesn't always happen, maybe doesn't usually happen, but um, and again, this gets back to your point of, you know, should I do this or that? I mean, you know, put yourself out there, um, get involved in stuff. And if you're not passionate about it, then don't waste your time or anyone else's time. Um, go find something you are passionate about because there's a big world out there. Um, but if this happens to be of interest, um, you know, go find some people, um, identify the problem. You know, that's the hardest part. Figure out what's the problem. Don't waste your time. Come up with some amazing idea if you don't know what the problem is. Um, identify the problem, identify the question, um, uh, and then start thinking and start doing stuff. Good stuff. Well, I definitely appreciate your time. Um, Absolutely. Can we, uh, we'll get the links from you for the, if anybody's interested in doing the telehealth and kind of being involved in that, put it on the website if that's okay. Absolutely. Um, so we'll encourage people to go there because I know I've had several of our followers on Instagram and whatnot reach out to us who have infectious disease uh, interests and thinking about that for residency and whatnot. So, um, and yeah, that is my final point. Why would you go into anything other than infectious disease? <laughs> that's because a good point. Anything else is uh, it's just not going to be a good life for you. Yeah. It's a terrible life. I can't even imagine. No, that's great. So we'll definitely put the links up, and uh, if anybody's involved or wants to be involved, can uh, spend some spend some time listening to you guys uh, go through it and get their get their learn on. Um, so appreciate your time today. Um, thanks for everyone listening. Um, appreciate you guys following the podcast. If you have any questions, concerns, anything like that, you can reach us on any of the social media platforms. Um, our email addresses will be in the show notes and uh, definitely appreciate everyone who takes the time to listen it means a ton. Um, and you know, if we can ever do anything to improve or, um, do any subjects you want us to cover, please reach out to us. We're more than happy to, uh, take any and all suggestions. So thank you guys so much for listening and we will see you next time. Thanks.